content warning. This podcast is intended for a mature audience, contains graphic descriptions of violence and explicit language. Hello, friends, and welcome back to Pods of the Multiverse. We're an unofficial D&D podcast where four friends play D&D. We're so glad to have you back at the table for our fourth game. I'm Andy, the DM for our adventures in the world of Theros. Let's go ahead and reintroduce my friends and the players for this game. I'm Jimmy. I play Gron, friend to one and all. Unless you're a Yeti, then look out. <laughs> I'm going to shove you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Scala. I play sometimes Andromedy, a human cleric wizard, and sometimes Clothis, a legendary enchantment creature god. <laughs> And my name is Jeppy. I play Clix, a not god, normal cat who is also a rogue. Well, there you go. Without further ado, let's jump back into it. All right, here we go. A recap. After meeting with Volkos and the other flame speakers at the monastery atop the mountain, eating with them and sharing your tale of the journey so far, he took you before a large fountain of lava and water, where he began a ritual for Andromedy to attempt to better see why fate binds you together and the threats that may lie ahead of you. Flung into the stuff of nightmares, Andromedy suffers a shocking revelation as the voice of Clothis herself speaks through them with a dire warning, that of a fearsome darkness and a weakened Nyx, and that something called Creation's Eye may offer aid against the coming evil. Volkos, reacting to this, sends Gron and Klix into visions of their own, and there they see figures of their past, that of Hargot and of Klix's father, Lyukar, and the focus of their visions drawing towards mysterious jewels they both possess. After an evening's rest, the party, on advice from Volkos, sets off with him guiding towards Mount Velus to seek the wisdom and aid of Perforos directly. Journeying across steep mountaintop passes, they manage to draw closer to the giant volcano, but not before getting caught in a snow squall and encountering a yeti. Working together, they manage to greatly injure the monster before Gron flung it off the mountainside with his horns. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> As a Gron do. <laughs> As a Gron do. So you're all still in the middle of this pop-up whiteout, very like Lord of the Rings, uh, side of the mountain, we must turn back. Volkos is guiding you forward. It is getting darker as you try and climb these mountains. You've just flung the Yeti off the side of the mountain. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't feel like time to, to get a tent going. I, I, if I remember, we're on like a steep, like we don't have a lot of leg room, so we can't Very stop. narrow passageway, yeah. snow and ice blowing all around you in the wind. Volkos looks to the three of you and says, we should find a safe place to camp. I don't know how long we'll have the light. Is there a ledge I could climb up onto to see if like this narrow pathway breaks or if we can go in? Well, there's inward? the one that the Yeti was on when you encountered it before it, it kind of jumped down. Yeah, Clicks will just go and climb up there uh, and take a look around. You go to, to climb the side of the mountain here. Go ahead and give me an athletics or acrobatics check with advantage. Uh, dirty 20. Okay. Easily enough. The rest of the party watches as Clicks deftly climbs the treacherous rock face uh, up to the ledge where the yeti had been perched. And now go ahead and give me a perception check. Uh, this would normally be with advantage, but because of the wind and this storm, there will be a disadvantage that cancels it out, so it's just a straight roll. Uh, 13. Through the wind, it's hard to kind of get a sense of too much direction at all, uh, but you can see ahead something of a clearing. It's still maybe a bit precarious just because you're literally on the tops of mountains, but it is definitely not so close to the edge as this pass is. And that's straight ahead, like so everyone will have to climb up the ledge? Yeah, it's on the same level as the ledge that you are on, and the ledge okay. that the rest of the party is on kind of keeps going off until you can't see it anymore. Okay. Volkos, do you know where this path leads before we attempt that climb? With the storm, I'll be honest, it's hard to tell, but I know another few hours or so, if we are not slowed down much farther, will lead to safer terrain. But if there is a landing to be found above us, perhaps we should seek it. Fair enough. Could you throw us down a rope or something? Is there rope in a burglar's pack? Probably. Burglars, yeah. We're just gonna say, there, gonna is. say there is. And burglars need rope all the time. I mean, they're always climbing into shit. That makes sense. Okay. I cast throw rope. <laughs> yeah, easily enough, 
you throw it down. The distance between the two ledges is not that great, although incredibly steep. Between the three of you that are still down there, you're able to catch it fine. No, no rolls required. So Andromedy has the bottom of this rope. How would you like to ascend? Oh, uh, real quick, is there like a rock I can tie it to? Because there is no fucking chance <laughs> I am hoisting up Gron. Hence why I <laughs> ask. Go ahead and give me a survival or investigation check. Is uh is a uh, twelve. Okay. There's not too much around. You find kind of a outcropping of rock behind mm-hmm. you along mm-hmm. the wall that continues to go up. Uh, you think that could at least help more than you just trying to pull everybody up. Oh, let's, let's go ahead and secure that, and then I'll also kind of hold and steady the rope. Clicks a little point to Andromedy and say, smallest one first. Cool. So as you're tying the rope, just go ahead and give me a quick sleight of hand check. That is a uh, dirty 20 on that. Oh, you, uh, you also have... Uh... Pitons or pythons? I don't know how. Pitons, pitons. You have pitons in your <laughs> burglar's pack. If you wanted to, I would prefer you call them pitons because then they're kitten pitons. <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> what? What are pittens? <laughs> Uh It's the things you you hammer them into the rock. Oh, yeah. it's like, it's like a ten- yeah, okay. Oh, we're gonna use we're gonna use the kitten pittons, please. Okay. Forget the whole rock thing, and we're just going to go. Is your rope making too much noise all the time? (laughs) Oh, my God. Um, All right. So, anyway, that whole rigmarole, and the the pittens look great. So, between the dirty 20, the fucking kitten pittens. (laughs) You you think this operation is is as secure as it can possibly be. So, this will be quite a low DC Andromedy if you are going first. This will be athletics or acrobatics. Sure, I will do that. Um, I'm going to cast Guidance on myself before I do. Okay. Fate, guide me. Let's go. That's going to be uh, 14. Okay. Easy enough. It's maybe a little precarious, but between all of the, you know, the things out of the burglar's kit, you're able to safely make it up. Volkos, watching this, kind of puts his hand on Gron's shoulder and says, Why don't you let me go next, eh, friend? So we can all, we can all help the big one up, yeah? Okay. So Volkos goes next, (laughs) succeeds easily, climbs up the rope, and then he looks at the two of you on the upper ledge. This one might be a little harder. (laughs) Uh, so, Gron, go uh, for you it. You can take a guidance, too. <clears throat> All right. And I can deliver that with Scully, so she can fly down, land on Gron, flop a little a little Nyx dust on him, and yeah, then fly Gr- back to me. Gron, a, a giant moth, lands on your shoulder. Ooh. We're being a little unfair to Gron. I mean, Gron may be heavy, but Gron is, uh, you know, strong. strong. Gron can climb a rope. Sure. (laughs) Gron is going to do better than any of us on this check. The DC is not for Gron, it's for the rope. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's see. Go for it. 15 athletics. Okay. Yeah, that will pass. Uh, The rope does not break, and between all of you, you you're able to ascend to this upper ledge. And indeed, after a few more moments traveling on this side, you find a small clearing where you think it's much better space to make a camp than what you were dealing with lower down. I want to find my hand axes that I threw at the Yeti and it was up here. Oh, you threw them up. That's right. Go ahead and give me investigation or perception. We're going to make this perception. 18. You find both of them. They are buried in a little bit of snow, but they are they're close by to where to where you climbed up. Yeah. Wouldn't want to lose those babies, eh, Gron? I've had these for a really long time. They're special. Oh, well, that's nice. <laughs> it is nice. <laughs> yep, just eager to make conversation with Gron. Okay, so moving over to camp, I suggest you all get some rest. I can't say what sort of elements we'll be up against. If this squall is anything of a precursor, it could get even worse. I'll take first watch, but you might want to be on our guard in the night. Agreed. I'll take second watch. It is still pretty cold, very windy. The snow and other precipitation has died down. The squall has passed, but you're still left in this kind of frigid, windy mountain air. Is there any, like, sort of scrub brush nearby uh, that might be flammable? I'll just say on, like, Clicks and, and Gron's previous perceptions, that really doesn't look like anything at all. It's all very sparse, rocky, snowy terrain. 
you uh, look about, and Volkos sees this and goes, Ah, not to worry, I am on it. And he takes a couple of small rocks out of his robe, places them in the snow on the ground in front of him, kind of near where you are setting up your camp, and points his hand down towards this collection of small rocks, and they ignite in a small bonfire. Wow, nice job. Oh, thank you, Gran. It's nothing, really, but it should keep us warm enough. Without a word, really, clicks just comes close and then gets into a little ball and makes his robe cover his full body because these conditions are simply untenable for a cat such as himself. Mm. Very good image. Unless there's anything else, I'm going to go ahead and roll for Volkos <coughs> on Perception. Okay. Uh, 16 on the dice, plus some other numbers. His watch passes without any issue. Up next is Gron. Uh, Gron, you can see when you wake, Volkos, instead of, like, laying down to sleep to rest, simply kind of shifts to the side to allow you to, to take your watch and begins meditating, which to Gron, I guess, would just look like he's sitting there instead of laying down. Gron thinks that's odd, but Gron has seen a lot of odd things in the past few days. Yeah. And is going to choose not to ask any questions about that. Cool. Gron dutifully takes his watch. Go for it. Twelve. Okay. On a twelve, I suppose one of the first things you would notice is that Nyx itself is a bit harder to see. There are a lot of clouds kind of swirling about on these mountains that obscure it quite a bit. Other than that, you don't see too much at all. You figure perhaps, you know, you're so high up in this desolate place that maybe there just aren't any animals or anything this high up to contend with. Uh, and as such, your watch is quiet. Okay. Let me guess I'm next. I wake Andromedy. All right, I wake up. I sort of go to the fire and... Uh, Clix, where is your stuff? I'd say most of Clix's things are under... Uh, under the robe with me. Yeah, I mean, cats do have this ability to turn into little tiny balls. So, like, tiny ball, full robe. Fair enough. Stuff. Yeah. Okay. Scala, are you uh, are you trying to give me a taste of my own medicine tonight? No, I just want to go into where Clix keeps his biscuit dough and make some biscuits. <laughs> If you want me to try, like, sleight of hand about this, I'm not going to attempt to be overly sneaky about it. Yeah, okay, go ahead and roll sleight of hand. Sure. Just a 13. Okay. What are you trying to do, actually? I'm just trying to get out Clix's frying pan or what have you and his biscuit dough and just make some... You realize... You realize that the entire time Jeppy has been saying making biscuits, he's not actually making biscuits, right? No, I didn't. I didn't <laughs> oh no! I oh my god! Oh I my god! This guy was waking up in the middle of the night to have a snack. <laughs> oh, oh, this is my favorite no. moment. No, when cats, oh. when cats like need. So it's yeah. it's needing. It's when you see like cats going like this with their like the paw thing that ah, they do. Okay. Yeah. I didn't realize that was what it was called. <laughs> yeah, it's not. There's not a physical biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> What are you doing? I will, like, heat up some food for my midnight watch. Okay. And I will nudge clicks a little bit. Do you have the... Is the food already made when you go to nudge clicks? It's, like, in the process of, of like... The bacon is still sizzling okay. or what have you. Clicks probably... Between the nudge and the smell of food, clicks wakes up. Kind of holes open the robe, still in balled-up form. And uh, groggily looks up to see Andromedy presumably staring right at him. No, Andromedy's sort of like looking off into the distance with, uh, you know, a thousand yard sort of stare, but we'll note your waking and say, Ah, good evening, Clix. I made a little extra if you want some. I thought it would be good for us to talk. Clix uh, goes back under his robe for an awkward 30 seconds before coming back out of the robe and standing up and stretching and quietly walking over to the food being cooked. And then just says... What else are you making? Nothing at the moment, just conversation. <laughs> I wonder, I have heard strange stories or read strange tales about the Leonin. I have heard that oracles born to them may consider themselves lucky if they are just exiled. Is that why you are separate from the rest of your people? Because you have heard the words of a god? I mean, you said it yourself. I'm separate from the rest of my people. You know more about us than I do. So you don't know why? Never have. 
then allow me to give you a word of caution. Leonin may not know much about the gods, but among humans, we know enough to be wary of the lures of Phoenix. One thing that all mortals know is that he is generous with gifts, but unforgiving of debts. And if I told you about the ways Leonin groom their manes and sharpen their teeth, what would you say? Exactly. Nothing. Because you're not a Leonin, and I'm not a human. And I don't need your advice. And he grabs a piece of half-cooked bacon and walks back to his spot. Andromedy holds out an arm and just puts it on Clix's chest and just says, Regardless, I would not become too reliant on his power. For when Clothis is finished repairing the damage that he helped create, their grip tightens a little bit. The last thing she will do before she returns to her eternal watch is drag that fugitive back to his place. And then Andromedy releases their grasp. Hell yeah. And lets their hand fall and lets Clix do whatever he wants. Clix looks Andromedy directly in the face and says, I've never relied on anyone before. My debts are always settled, and so far you're the only one that's made a threat to me. And walks back. Back to their ball-shaped form under their robe, bacon in hand, going back to sleep. Goddamn. Spicy stuff. (laughs) (laughs) It's not a threat, it's a warning. I say that under my breath, not so clicks can hear, and I go back to my corner, and I let my moth do the little circle around the camp. Clicks, just before you close your robe back in on yourself. I'm going to need you to go ahead and roll a d6. Alright. Two. Clicks, for just the briefest moment, perhaps between two blinks of the eye, you swear you see golden masks on everyone in camp. And then as soon as as soon as you blink again, they're, they're gone. Okay, that is fucking cool. Thank you. <laughs> Jeppy, I don't know if clicks would really recognize what returned masks look like, but this is what they are. Uh, yeah, I don't think clicks would at all, and I think clicks would probably shake this off as like I middle of the night. At the very least, clicks would then just recognize them plainly as death masks that happen to be made of gold. So, Andromedy, let's have that watch check. Uh, that's pretty good. That's gonna be a. 19 perception. Towards the end of your watch, the winds die down a bit and the clouds begin to break overhead. You are able to see a very large image of Perforos working uh, in the direction in which you are heading overhead. As well, the only mountain that has any sort of skyline above the ridges that you are traveling on is the one you assume to be Mount Velus. It is the only thing that raises far above the surrounding landscape, and it is drawing near. You can tell that you are probably less than a day's hike away. Noted. And your watch concludes. The rest of the party wakes from camp, and you see Volkos rise from his meditation. Hope you are ready for another day's travel. Did you even sleep? (laughs) A fair question, Gron. I rarely truly sleep anymore. I was meditating, trying to discern some wisdom in the recent events of our lives. Is that something I can learn? Oh, a fair question also. And he places a hand on his chest. If you begin here with the breath, learn to cast all other things away, then you may be able to begin to open your mind to see a greater world around. It takes time. But I am led to believe that more are capable of it than they think. Gran puts his hand on his chest and takes a deep breath. Roll religion. Fifteen. Okay. You take your deep breath, feeling the air in and out of your body. It doesn't really feel any different. Cold up here. Aye, we best get moving. So, let's go ahead and have some survival checks from everyone as we begin the second day's journey towards Mount Velus. Y'all can put a D4 on this. 17. 18. 13. 
Volkos also rolling an 18. So together with the kind of clear weather that you have for the moment, as well as everybody generally rolling very high, you continue along this path and find little impeding you on your journey. I am, however, now going to need everybody to also roll me a constitution saving throw. This is for the fact that you are very high up, the air is getting very thin, and you may begin to feel some of that effect on your bodies. 13. I feel all right. 10. That's a nat 20. Quix doesn't feel a damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> Just chilling, had his bacon, fully rested, we're good to go. I'll tell you right now that the, the DC for this first one was only a 10, but Andromedy, even so, starting out here this morning, you feel the thin air, uh, you feel it being a bit harder to breathe, and you can tell the farther up you guys go, you could potentially start to feel some, some exhaustion from this trek. The weather, you can notice, is starting to pick up ahead. You begin to lose sight of the peak of Velus in the distance. Let's go ahead and have another series of survival checks. 21. 17. Mm. 7. Incrementally getting more difficult, the weather begins swirling around you, and I'm going to need somebody to go ahead and roll me a d4, please. One. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Gron, your danger sense begins to ping as the earth beneath all of your feet uh, begins shaking violently. I'm going to need everybody to make me a dexterity saving throw. Cool. Is 17. Uh, perfectly average 12. 18. The ground begins trembling, and Volkos shouts out, Everyone, watch out! As columns of lava spring forth from the ground around you, this burst of a micro-volcanic eruption. From the gouts of flame and dramedy, you are unable to step out of the way, and you take six fire damage, and everybody else taking three as these burst up out of the ground and then in an instant kind of die down and begin pooling around the path that you are treading. Oh, Volkos kind of trying to jump out of the way and dodge these gouts. It's the dragon! <laughs> oh, trust me, Gron. You would know if it was a dragon. Just everyone step careful. That could have been way worse. I rolled pretty low on those uh, flame geysers. Uh, that, unfortunately, being one failure. Everybody go ahead and roll me another con save for the exhaustion that may be gripping some of you. Okay. Uh, 22. I feel like I'm wow. burning through my yeah, good Clicks rolls early. Yeah, like really <laughs> ripping them. <laughs> what kind of bad shit is coming out after this, though? Like, it, it, it... <laughs> My highest die roll today has been a 10. Was this it? No, this is a nat 1. <laughs> Uh-oh. No. no. You're going to be tired. Andromedy, one level of exhaustion. Okay. 23. Gron feels great. Gron, you think you're on a <laughs> leisurely hike through the countryside. <laughs> it was cold, and then it was hot. I feel fine. Gron's like one of those annoying as fuck personal trainers that's like you can do extra yeah I'm, i've like, been <laughs> jogging the whole time gotta keep my yeah, heart rate up <laughs> she's got a headband on like fuck you man amazing this isn't just i amazing. want to go back to the library i want to go back to the library no no andromedy of faith we are nearing our destination i hope there's somewhere warm to read there oh it will be quite warm indeed i can assure you of that all right, one more round of survival checks. Twelve. Oh my fucking god. <laughs> nat one? <laughs> I got the one in 400 chance of two nat ones in a row. Oh no. Oh my god. Oh, That's going to no. total a six for my check. Okay. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> All right. Okay. I switched dice too. It's, it's not a dice problem. It's a curse problem. It is a curse problem. I have a 13. On my roll. These are low rolls. Oh, man. These are not good rolls. How'd Volkos do? Uh, Volkos has been doing great. He got an 18 on that one. Oh, that's good. <laughs> just slowing him down. Loaded dice. No, he's just kind of good at this. That's why he... Why he thought he should come. This is exactly why I thought I should come. 
but on a 12 average, uh, I'm going to go ahead and need somebody to roll another d4, please. No, oh, fuck. I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, you know, you should do it. Uh, yeah, you get the fuck away from your dice. I don't want anything to do with whatever you're going to roll. Well, I did the roll. Yeah, go ahead, Jeppy. Four. Okay. This one not as bad. So as you are traveling along, you see a another large snow squall begin to billow up all around you. The wind begins roaring and howling. This fierce gust. I need everybody to go ahead and make a strength saving throw. 19. 17. Hey, there's, there's a decent roll. Clicks, what do you got? Yeah, no, uh, th- here it begins. Uh, the death knell of my dice rolls for the rest of the night. That is going to total a six. Uh-oh. Not a great roll from Volkos. All right. Andromedy and Gron, you begin to see Volkos and Clicks losing their footing on this precarious path and you can plainly see that this this path is very narrow this fierce practically hurricane winds rushing up out of nowhere the wind and snow they begin falling off the side of the mountain Volko shouting out clicks your rope i'd like to cast web okay uh, and i'd like to sort of cast it anchored on the side of the cliff and then going up and anchoring on the like ledge above us so it's sort of forming like you know those nets in rock climbing places sure i kind of want to make that okay with the web spell you use an action to do this so you all see andromedy cast this web spell and clicks and volkos fall into this web and are caught before tumbling down the steep side of this mountaintop Wow. Oh, oh, Andromedy. Well done. Thank you. It does require a strength check against the spell's DC, which is 14, to break free. I'll pull him out. Okay, yeah. I was just going to let you have it, but Gron <laughs> wants to roll. Go ahead and roll. Do. Yeah, that's a 16. I grab Clicks by the scruff of the neck and just pull him out of this web. Aw. Clicks, do your front arms curl up? Oh, yeah. Cl- Clicks is absolutely subdued, but has no memories of, of, of kittenhood, unfortunately. Mm. So it's oh. just yeah. just being held by a minotaur by the scruff of his neck. Volkos kind of climbs up the bit of rock side and, and gets up and grabs Andromedy's arm and kind of just gives you a look. Yeah, uh, Clicks does the same. Clicks doesn't say anything but looks to Andromedy and just, you know, uh, a grateful but curt nod in their direction. I just smile at both of them placidly. I'm going to say Andromedy, after that little encounter, go ahead and roll me a d6, please. Uh, That's a three. Andromedy, you look back towards the path as the group begins to move again. And for a moment, the swirling clouds that remain from this pop-up, white-out, snow squall, what have you, turn a brilliant and bright gold before fading into the sky. Can I roll religion, perhaps, to interpret that? Go for it. Nope. Nope, that's a nat one. (laughs) Third one of the night. Let's get a tally going. (laughs) This is some wild shit. Might be an omen. Who knows? Only an oracle could say. Only an oracle could, could say. They could fucking say. roll properly, they had, could say. <laughs> if if yeah. we had one with us. Let alone two. Anyways. Okay, this is going to be one more, because that was an, another fail. You're looking for one more success here before you reach the summit. One more survival check. 13. I only got a 10. 23. Okay. Nope. 13. I thought there was a one there. There is not. 13. Oh, no. These are worse. <laughs> oh, shit. These are worse. I did not expect this to take this long. And Volkos, not rolling great either. Still a 16 total. Volkos saying, I think we should have been approaching the summit by now. Velus should be directly in front of us. He's looking around, and as he's saying this, from either side of the path, you begin to see lava bubbling out of the rock faces. And from within them, you almost faintly hear laughter or voices of some kind. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, be on guard, everyone. It's all right, I think. Volko says. Everybody go ahead and give me a perception check. 13. Another nat 20. Nice. Uh, I too 
Got a nat 20. Oh, fuck. For this pointless roll. Hey, there you go. <laughs> well, um... Well, yeah, maybe not pointless. Maybe but. not, because in the lava, clicks and Andromedy, you can plainly see faces forming and cackling and laughing at your party. <laughs> oh, wait, I'm at disadvantage. Mm. Um... One in four hundred. One no. in four hundred. One in four hundred. Oh my god. Two Are nat ones me? and two nat twenties. Yeah, two nat twenties. What the fuck is happening? I, I, I have no clue. No. And to be clear, that was a different dice. Yeah, yeah different dice. Yeah, different dice. Oh no. Everything is fucked. Everything is fucked. Um, Clicks, you think these are some kind of fey, some sort of trickster, natural beings of nature. Andromedy, you know these to be something known as mephits. These are usually quite hostile and like to prey on lost travelers, specifically. You can tell that they're they're probably going to try and attack you. Okay, I think I'll just fire off a, a magic missile at one of the ones that is appearing. There are three total. Three of them. Um... I think I'm just going to concentrate on one for now, and they are just going to take 11 points of force damage. Okay. Gran is very confused why you just attacked lava. Yeah, Gran, you just see lava. You don't see any people, any images of anything inside. Volkos saying, whatever they say, ignore it. They mean us harm. And let's everybody roll initiative. 14. 13. Uh, That's going to be a 12 for me then. Volkos, up first. He's going to fire at one of the ones that Andromeda you did not attack. He's going to Guiding Bolt, another one of these Mephits, with a nat 20. So double dice on this. Okay. You see one of the second figures within the lava actually get shot out of this lava, and you can now see one of their forms. Gron, you see this small, odd, sinister, fairy-looking creature with a long, hooked nose and leathery but fire-like wings. It pops out of this lava, and a bit of its form scatters as it's quite injured by this guiding bolt. It's also now glowing because of the guiding bolt. The next attack on it has advantage, and we go to the Mephits themselves. The one that was blown out of its cover is going to claw attack Gron. Uh, misses, I believe, on a 14. Yes. The other two still from cover. The one that you attacked Andromedy, it comes out kind of cackling. <laughs> In this little impish voice. Andromeda, go ahead and make a dex save for me. Twelve. Okay. So it's laughing, and you can see smoke and fire begin to come out of the sides of its mouth, and it opens and fires a flame breath at you. Making the save, you're going to take half of this, so you take five total fire damage. The third will come out and attack clicks with its claws. That's a 15, which will hit, I believe. Hits. Yep. And clicks, you take four slashing damage and four fire damage. Okay. And that is Gron's turn. Gron, you now see these three impish fey creatures made of fire swirling around your party. Two of them are injured, one is not. I'm going to run right up on this one that's faintly glowing, the one that Volkos attacked. Okay. And I'm going to hit it with my maul. Or I'm going to attempt to, anyway. Go for it. I think I will. That's a 23 to hit. Yeah, that'll fucking hit. Yeah, I just... That's 10 bludgeoning damage. All right, Gron, kind of like a seasoned home run slugger. Wind up your maul and slash out at it. You hear the shattering of rock and stone as this small fey being just poofs into a cloud of dust and cinders. Gron, as it explodes, go ahead and give me a dexterity saving throw. That's a 17. Okay, that will pass, and so you're going to take half of the following fire damage as this guy explodes. That is four fire damage. Ooh, spicy. And the remains fall to the ground. As one of them is destroyed, one of the other ones you hear cackle and say... You seek that which lies within the volcano, but you will only find ruin! 
this kind of crazy little imp voice. And uh, Clix, you are up next. All right. Clix is, is uh, going to react to being attacked by the one and attack it back. And he isn't going to do that because that was too... That will miss. You can still go ahead with your offhand, but the first swing misses. Uh, 19 probably will do it. That'll do it. Drum roll. Three damage. Jeffy, you can roll sneak attack on your attack. That is two damage. Okay, so five total. So when I cast Heroism on Gron, um, I will use my voice of authority to allow him to attack again. Oh, nice. Very cool. What do you say when you cast this? Uh, the same sort of vibe, just uh, as Scully sort of flies this tapestry of a heroic deed from the past and drapes it over Gron's shoulders, uh, Andromeda just says, feel the, the strength within you, fulfill your destiny, and be a hero. Go get him, champ. Can do. Cool. So Gron can attack. Wait, what? Yeah, you can take your reaction to attack. That's my voice of authority. Great. Okay. I'm going to recklessly attack it. Go for it. I'm feeling really brave. I'm feeling full of hubris. I'm going to attack this thing with my maul. It sort of landed on the edge, one of them. It's balanced between 19 and 2. That's really weird. You can reroll it if you want to. But it feels like cheating. But a 17 hit? A 17 would hit, yeah. All right, I'm going to take I'll it. I'll give it to you. Yeah, all right. Uh, then... That's 13 bludgeoning damage. Very hurt. All right. So swing into it. So Andromeda, that was your action. Anything else? I'm just going to back a little further away from this uh, combat so I don't get, you know, any more fire breath happening on me. All right. Volkos up next. Uh, he says to the one that spoke out, The only doom we will be seeking today is yours, friends. And he will kind of take his hands and you see them begin to faintly glow as he strikes out with these monastic key-infused blows. Uh, striking once, you see he quickly follows that up with two more attacks. One of them hitting, one of them missing. Monk's gonna monk. See the one that was previously injured by Andromedy. He punches out with these fists, and the Mephit bursts into another cloud of dust. Nice. That is one Mephit remaining. <laughs> Going to fire breath towards Clicks and Gron. I need both of you to make dexterity saving throws. Twelve. Eight. Okay, Gron passes. Clicks, however, does not. So clicks that is eight fire damage and Gron that is four. And that's Gron. Um Alright, I'm gonna smash this thing. Gron's gonna smash. I'm gonna smash. I'm gonna smash recklessly. Hmm. Thirteen will still do it, right? Thirteen will still hit it, yep. Alright. That's ten bludgeoning damage. Gron, go ahead and paint the final picture here. I um, pin it down with my foot and then with my maul kind of just aim hey, right I, for its head. Get off of me! What are you doing? Like a no, stop. I, uh, It fucking bursts into a cloud of fire and dust and is extinguished. Give me one more dex save, Gron, as you slay the final Mephit. That's a 12. Okay, that will also just pass. Not too high of a DC on these. So that's half again. <laughs> Double fucking ones. <laughs> One fire damage. Ah, end of combat. Oh, well, that was rather exciting, wasn't it? Well, uh, we should be on our way. We really should be able to get there before nightfall, but at this rate, who knows? Uh, and with that said, let's go ahead and have one more group of survival checks. Don't forget your D4s. Oh, didn't need it because I got a nat fucking 20, but I also got a three on the D4, go. a total of 20. Yes. Well, I hope that makes up for my, uh, once again, same number on the D20 as the D4. That'll be a total of seven for me. Oh. At least I beat you. I got a nine. <laughs> oh, guys. <laughs> oh, no. Come on, Volkos. Yeah, here we Come go. On, Let's Volkos. see. Hot money. That's a 19 on the die. All right. Nice job, Volkos. Does Volkos also get a D4? Uh, yeah, he's a cleric, too. He can he can guide himself. Uh, plus three. 
Volko skidding a 27 total. And a 25, and then whatever bullshit <laughs> these little fucking laggards gave us. Oh my god, you literally passed the DC by one. You got a 17 average. Success or not, I need everybody to make one more con save, and then I will tell you what happens next. 24. What? <laughs> <laughs> Gron is healthy. 15. 12. You all feel brisk air quickly become much warmer as you come to another ridge, now well above the tops of the other mountains around your path. The temperate air kind of shocking your systems as you look up to see a single enormous mountain in front of you that towers further into the sky with billowing smoke rising from its distant peak as slowly moving trails of molten rock spew from errant outcroppings at its sides. In front of you, you see a jagged and steep set of stairs that come to an enormous set of doors built into the side of the mountain itself. Volkos looks up at the scene before bowing deeply and says, ah, It has been some time since I have seen these doors. I have not the words to describe the majesty. Welcome to Mount Velas, everyone. I'm going to go take a closer look at these doors. Uh, they're still pretty far away from you. But go ahead and give me a perception check anyways. Nope. 14. Mm, five. <laughs> Gron, as your party approaches, you can see that there are two enormous braziers or urns or something of the like on either side of these massive doors that are unlit. You can also see that the doors themselves uh, appear to be made of a heavy, dark metal of some kind, something that you have never seen before, and there is gold and bronze inlay in ornate, angular patterns on the doors. But also on a 14, you can see that there's a small group of people, humanoid figures, at the base of the stairs as you approach. Who are they? Volkos looks up. Oh, that's... that's very odd. The Chosen are not meant to be out of the temple. The Chosen? Yes, the... the Chosen of Perforos. They are... well, they represent the pinnacle of mortal ability in... in craftsmanship, in Perforos's domain. There is a... well, they are called the Smith, and the Sculptor, and the Painter, and the Scribe, and they are the residents of this great temple, but I... I know not why they would be outside. Do you think they'd mind if we ask them? We should speak to them. Yeah, let's go ask. Yeah, so you approach, and you indeed see four figures. They are wearing very simple red robes, but you can see that they all have... Actually, uh, I think Andromedy would know what this is, but Clix and Gron, just go ahead and roll me perception checks while I describe this. 22. Same, but without the 20. <laughs> so it's you. Yeah, clicks, you have no idea. But they all appear to have different parts of their body almost made or covered entirely in bronze. Andromedy and Gron, to you, it looks like kind of those, some of the creatures that you have encountered, but these appear to be anvil wrought appendages of sorts. As you approach, Volkos bows to this party of figures and says, Hail, chosen. We have come from the monastery atop the mountain. I am Flamespeaker Volkos. He bows deeply, and one of the figures steps out from the group and bows back. They lower their hood, and you see a clean-shaven, bald-headed figure, and their voice speaks out with sort of a rumble to its tone, and, and they say, By our master's very breath, we have been told to leave this temple. Rejoice and hear the good word, Flame Speaker. The Forge God is in his dwelling place. Oh, well, why would he send you out? What is what is happening here? And you listen as the smith continues. You can see their hands are made entirely of bronze. They continue uh, as they raise their hands up towards the doors. This wondrous temple to him is to be purged. The cycle of creation, which he inspires, may start anew. Volkos turns back to the three of you and says, Oh, this is not good news. They're going to flood the temple. 
Do we know when this is taking place? The smith turns towards you and says, Oracle, welcome. You see, his rage boils at this turning of the tides. Even in his anger, though, he has sought to spare us. The greater world has not yet seen this, but in time they very well may. We know the gods of war clash while the god of destiny seethes. Has your master told you what he intends to respond to this chaos with? It is not our place to ask, for we are merely his chosen. Those who work his wonders into the mortal world, we perfect our crafts in his visage. We hear his words, and we do his work, but it is not our place to spread his message. He turns to Volkos, the flame speakers. This is their purpose. Well, you are not wrong, great smith. But I have seen in a vision to bring this party of heroes to this temple to seek the Forge God's aid. Well, I see. We shall not stop you, but be warned. The temple itself may try your passage. Indeed, lava may flood those chambers within at any moment. Saying this in kind of a, a reverence and awe, they conclude saying, Seek his wisdom, but do not tempt his wrath. They kind of bow to your party, all four of them at once. I return the, the bow. Well, this is most challenging. Volkos kind of looks at the ground around and then back up at the doors. What do the three of you do? Well, let's go inside. Clicks nods approvingly of that plan. I imagine if Perforos called us here, he did not do it simply to bury us in his cleansing of the temple, purging of the temple, what have you. Or maybe he did. <sighs> Indeed, or maybe he did. Either way, let's go. <laughs> Practical Garan. All right, let's go. Volkos turns to the Chosen a final time and says, Chosen of the Volcano Temple, we seek passage that we may see the Forge God himself. The Chosen bow once more, and you see two by two, they move towards the two enormous braziers and raising up their hands, fire pours into them out of thin air, and they alight. The ornate etchings on the door begin to glow, and the door slowly opens. As the three of you move up the stairs towards the opening doors, Volkos following behind now, the doors fully open. They reveal a grand entryway, lit by pillars of lava flowing from the walls. Gold and bronze and other brilliant adornments decorate the walls in intricate designs and filigree. This entire space looks more like a museum, or itself a work of great art, rather than a cavern temple. A large set of steps lead upward, lined with pristine columns built out of the rock, the end of this chamber. At the top of those steps, you see a large metallic archway whose keystone is made of a giant red stone. From the archway pours a waterfall of lava that flows into a central pool in the middle of the chamber. And you would also plainly see two smaller archways on either side of that, both leading to hallways or, or, or doorways or something to the right and left of this space. Are all of the decorations, like, I mean, is it paint? Is it like the walls are painted and adorned and etched? Or is it, you know, are there... Are there artifacts to steal? Yeah, that's exactly, <laughs> I mean, you know exactly where I'm going with that. Go ahead and give me a perception. That is an 18. Okay. In this entryway, clicks. you look at these walls and you discover that it's not actual paint, rather literal veins of metal that are shaped into the wall in all of these patterns. And and you kind of scratch at it a little bit with, with one of your claws. And it's, it yeah, it's, it's almost as if it's, it's an entire vein through the whole wall rather than just on the surface itself. Okay. All you have to say is not steel. Not steel. That's literally all, <laughs> all clicks cares about. Beautiful. <laughs> Unmovable. This space is also quite hot, as there is a literal pool of lava in the center of all of this rock. Well, um, I know not the fastest way to the inner chambers, but which way do you think we should go? He says, looking to Andromedy. Um, do I get a vibe from either of the uh, doorways? A uh, vibe check. Let's see here. <laughs> go ahead and roll insight. Clothis, what path should we take? 15 insight. Okay. 
You ascend the steps towards the archways, and you don't really get any sort of feeling from one way or another. In fact, oddly, you feel like they both might be valid paths. You know, I'm always partial to going left. Let's go left. Very well. Clix makes a comment, kind of under, under his breath. Great, the one that led us to the building that's about to be flooded is telling us where to go. Andromedy leading the way, you find a hallway beyond this archway that has stairs that descend until you find a series of doors, each leading into small living spaces, as well as a larger door, which leads to a modest sized but finely furnished uh, sort of mess hall, a communal space here with a large stone oven built into the back wall. Oh, well, Andromedy, it seems you've led us straight to dinner, Volkos says. Well, I'm afraid we haven't the time. Well, you're probably right. Do any of you go into the space, or do you just kind of remain in the hallway? Clix will go and swipe some food and pocket it for later. Does it look like there's, like, a, another way out of this room, or not? Nah? From the hallway, you don't see any, but Clix, as you walk in, you actually immediately do. There is a small balcony that is directly above the entryway that you wouldn't have seen from the hallway. You don't see any stairs that would lead to this balcony from this room, but you can plainly see an an open archway that is above the entrance to this space that leads somewhere else. There's a balcony over here. Are there, like, steps leading up to it or anything? Nope. It's just a, a single small balcony with one door. You assume you get to it from somewhere else. No, it's just a single small balcony with one door. <laughs> And that seems to be the only <laughs> the only other, like, ingress to this room? To this room, yes. The hallway continues on further, but that is what you see so far. All right, let's keep heading down the hallway then. Okay. You continue down the main hallway, and it begins to turn right at a corner and lead into a large chamber in which the architecture is not as finely carved. There are rock walls secured by large columns at various points, and within this chamber you see mine carts filled with various unrefined ore and rock, as well as large cauldrons and pits of lava and water, as well as other metal-working devices, uh, you assume for processing various materials. From this space you see two exits. You see one that leads down into kind of a cave or kind of mine shaft of sorts, and another which is a large ornate spiral staircase leading up. Clix is drawn to the ornate staircase. He starts walking towards it, looking back, hoping the team will agree, but not saying much. I'll follow. Ornate means nice shit to steal. Volkos looking at these scenes in this space, just kind of looking around. Oh, I'm sure there's a pretty copper or two in that ore, but we wouldn't want to tempt fate now, would we? Wouldn't we? Oh, I think Clix has the right idea. We would want to, uh... Hurry our paces as much as we could. Sure, that's the idea. He throws a wink to Andromedy. <coughs> Flicks, you can very clearly see Volko's wink at Andromedy after he says that. You ascend these stairs and find an enormous chamber above. This is a very large forge room. You can see, firstly, directly on the opposite side of this room, another large spiral staircase that goes back down. You assume to a different chamber, a different room, whatever it is. And on the other two walls, to your right and left, you see a large, ornate red door in the similar construction as the entrance to this temple. And on the opposite end, you see a large golden door with similar construction to the other large, ornate doors. Go ahead and give me perception checks. Oh, uh, okay. 18. There are some small unlit braziers on either side of both of these doors. You also see that there are several forges in this space, some with open pools of lava, others with large anvils of various sizes and shapes. Also on that roll, you see that kind of scattered about this space, there are columns that at passing glance just look like ordinary stone columns, but you focus on a group of them, and they, they look almost like organ pipes. There are these kind of divots and, and slash marks in various places on all of them, and they're in various sizes. Hmm. I'll point that out to the others. Don't you think that arrangement is sort of odd for columns? 
I wouldn't know. Volkos looks up at them and says, Oh, well, I can only imagine that that is the system of gas vents that leads into this chamber. You see, the, the Chosen, the Smiths in particular, they use the fumes from the fires and the, the smokes of this mountain to inspire their great creations. I see. I think we should forget about the pillars. What's behind that gold door? Why don't you go open it? Clicks goes to open it. You see no handles on this door, Clicks. Go ahead and give me a perception or investigation check. 22. You see on the corners of this doorway, the filigree made of bronze goes directly from the door to the walls and leads directly down to the base of these urns. Try pushing on it. Clicks will start by trying to push the door. I have a feeling it ain't going to budge, but let's give it a shot. Go ahead and give me a strength check. 11. They do not budge at all. Yeah. Volkos approaches you, seeing you doing this, and says, I do not know if this course is wise. I think anything behind this door is probably worth pursuing. And then, you know, gesturing at the wires in the wall over to the braziers, Click says, I think we need to light these. That may be the way into this door, but very well. As you wish. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Anybody, actually Andromedy, go ahead and give me insight. Andy is giving us so many opportunities to not make this mistake. <laughs> not one. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. I, don't, I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I'm too tired. Very well. Sounds like a great idea. <laughs> uh, like, I'm just, I'm just too tired to argue. Whatever. You want me to light the thing? I'll light the thing. Yes, Andromedy, would you please aid me as he lights one of them pointing to the other? Yeah, I'll conjure up a firebolt and throw it in there. Very cool. You light these two braziers and the door begins to glow and open inward. And you find within a large and very finely furnished room, though all of the furniture is much larger than anything you have ever seen before. There are countless works of art, each more remarkable than the last, as well as a myriad of weapons and armor seemingly just cast about in this space. You see a small hallway that is at the end of the room that goes kind of out and then in a T. Uh, so you can't see where either direction might go. You also hear the echoing of very heavy footsteps in this space. Oh, I... I suddenly think I know who might be in this room. We should be very careful. Everybody go ahead and roll me perception. I grip my maul. 21. 9. 11. I don't think they will mean us any harm, but I have never met them. Of whom do you speak? Very few mortals know that he exists, but... <laughs> Everyone, say hello to Petros. You look up and see a gargantuan humanoid figure stepping through this space, their form perhaps hidden previously by some giant magnificent statue or pile of golden pottery. Uh, they step out and you see what looks like a giant, entirely made of bronze, form of Perforos. But as you look, you can clearly see that there are small details that are different than most images of Perforos. This figure looks down at you with a calm yet quizzical look. How do you all respond? Hi, my name's Gron. I sort of give a, a bow, like a, just a greeting bow, not like a not like a deep bow, just like a hello and thank you for your hospitality sort of thing. The back of Clix's fur bristles a little bit and he steps back a little bit. Not probably super noticeable to everyone, but definitely a little freaked out. This figure bends down and, taking a knee in front of the four of you, looks to go to speak, but no words come out of his mouth. Instead, he lowers his hand as if he is going to to grab you, Clix. What do you do? <laughs> Clix is going to try to run. <laughs> Clix, you, you back away, and this figure that 
Volkos has identified as someone named Petros kind of looks almost scared of, of your reaction and backs away slowly, still kneeling on the ground. Oh, it's it's all right. It's all right. Volkos puts out a hand. He is he is something of well, quite frankly, he looks around the the entire space. This is something of Perforos's twin. Andromedy, go ahead and make a religion check. I'm too tired to remember anything I've read. Uh, that's a seven total. Even on a seven, you begin to look about the space, and you can see these very finely made murals that are on the walls in this enormous room. Volkos points to all of them as this figure, Petros, is now sitting on the ground in front of you, just kind of staring at all four of you. And he says, Ah, this is a story I have not recalled in many years. I did not imagine that he would actually live here. But, well, you see, when the world was young, Perforos was jealous of Eroes and Mogus and wanted a twin of his own. And so, you see, he created Petros, a Nyx-born double of himself, crafted of bronze. But, and then he points to Petros, which now you can see that there are small patches of gold and bronze on top of the layer of metal. Petros aged as the eons passed, and Perforos was forced to constantly patch the cracks with various metal and continue to feed the vessel of his Nyx-born twin. It is believed, for the few that know of this tale, that he lacks the sort of spark of true godhood or life, and isn't known to speak. Instead, he toils away constantly, all the day and all the night, in, in his forge, making all the wonders you see before you. I had no idea, he says as he looks about the room once more. So, you just don't want to take this stuff, or...? I wonder... He cannot speak, but I, I wonder if he can understand. Where is your brother? He bends his head down towards yours. You see the large helm that adorns his head and his burning eyes behind the layer of bronze. And he nods as if recognizing this. Make a persuasion check. Uh, nope. Uh, only an eight. He kind of leans back up and begins to get up after you say this. It looked like he understood you, but seems to be ignoring your plea at this time. All right. Well, to me, it seems like he wants to be left alone. Maybe we should try the red door. As you say this, you see he kind of slowly moves over to a large crafting bench and begins banging on something. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna head back into the room we came from, but... <laughs> <laughs> Y'all are free to try and convince this guy, or I don't know, Jeppy. Maybe you want to steal something. No, Seems a little chancy. He's, he's... Rooms full of stuff. Stuff that looks really, really valuable. Clicks love stealing, but love surviving a lot more. Do I see any big weapons? Go ahead and give me a perception check. All right, fourteen. Even on a 14, you see every possible kind of weapon you have ever seen and several more that you have never seen before scattered about this room. They all look just unbelievably well made. That Each one a work of art as much as it is a masterfully crafted weapon. Hmm. I find a maul and uh, pick it up and examine it. You find a maul, but... It's not exactly the same kind of brutish construction as your man-sized maul. This is a long, sort of metallic halberd that comes to a very heavy hammer at one end. The entire thing made of bronze with very finely made wooden shaft that has all sorts of filigree and, and finery with it. You pick this up, and this thing is absolutely beautiful, as well as you think could do a quite a number. As you pick it up, Petros stops his work and immediately looks down towards you. Did you make this? He looks at you for a moment and then slowly nods his head. This is beautiful. He turns towards you. Make a, make a persuasion check. Six. He turns down towards you. He looks at you for a moment. You can see a thought on his face. And with his giant hand, he tries to take them all from you. What do you do? I let him take it. I'm not going to start a fight with this huge guy. He takes it out of your hand, <laughs> and he very gently places it back on the pile of weapons where you found it. Sorry. I don't think you're taking that fucking maul. <laughs> I think that's staying right where it was. Uh, maybe another time. <laughs> I don't think you asked the right question, Gron. I think perhaps... 
Volkos comes over to this scene and says, Petros, master craftsman, capable of heights beyond any mortal comprehension. My friend Gran, he points to you, would like to wield this magnificent maul into battle in your honor. Gran, he gives you advantage on that persuasion roll. All right. Now it's a 14. Okay. Petros looks down at you and looks at Volkos and looks back at you. He picks up the maul and he holds it in front of you. For me? He kind of nudges it towards you. I take it. He lets you have it. Wow. Thank you. He nods. You know, I made my own maul, but this is way better. He tilts his head as if wishing to see it. Oh, yeah. I, I have it right here. And I hold up. You hold it out? Yeah. I hold it up, like kind of offering it to him mm -hmm. and say, I constructed this maul out of the bones of my enemies and various rocks and logs that I found in the wastelands of Phobaros. You see Petros grin with this large bronze smile. He takes the man-sized maul from your hands as you offer it to him, and he places it very carefully so that it is, is standing upright at the top of this array of weapons. Oh. Well, look at that, Gron. I don't think there's any mortal soul who can say that they have one of their own weapons in this place. Wow. I bow to Petros. Petros gets down on, on both knees and fully bows in front of you. His form takes up practically like a, a quarter of this entire giant room. And then he gets back up and goes back to work. All right. I turn and quietly leave the room with my new mall. Okay. So you have just <laughs> received... A Petrosian Maul. This is considered a magical weapon, and it has kind of an interesting property. You roll regular dice for the weapon damage, 2d6, but you cannot roll ones. All ones are treated as twos. Okay. Nice. Upon exiting Petros's hall, you notice that there is a faint, very high-pitched sound coming from the walls around you, and suddenly some smoke begins to pour out of the pipes on the various outcroppings of the walls around you. What do you all do? Well, I'm not looking to get high right now, so I'm gonna leave. Would I have enough time to, like, light the two braziers on the red door before the room starts to fill with smoke? Mechanically, I'll just tell you no. Okay, then I'm heading down the stairs. Down the opposite stairs. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I, I think Andromedy has the right idea. Perhaps we seek refuge for a moment. We don't quite know the full extent of what that gas could do. As this sort of faintly sulfurous smoke begins to fill this chamber, you seek refuge down the other set of stairs and find yourself in a unlit room. The stairs descend very far into this chamber, such that you assume the ceiling is very high. Andromedy, passive perception alone, you can immediately smell a familiar and welcoming scent, that of paper and books. The room is unlit, but in the middle of this large space, you can see a small ember, uh, perhaps of a, a fire pit or, or something of the like, dimly glowing. Uh, I'll chuck a firebolt in there, uh, see if I can get it going. Okay. You throw a firebolt towards this faint light source, and it immediately erupts in a small fire. And from that, two little, um, it's almost like at the end of National Treasure, when there's a little, like, oil slick that kind of lights an entire room and kind of goes about. So that happens. <laughs> <laughs> and you stand in the middle of an enormous library. You see several statues and other works of art, as well as rows of shelves and stacks upon stacks of scrolls and books that stretch up the full height of these high walls. Brilliant filigree decorates and is reflecting now off of the light uh, uh, on the ceiling itself. And you can see bronze ladders resting at various positions about the walls of this library that kind of help to set a scale of the enormity of this collection. Where to begin? I think we're going to be here a while. I wish. I wish I had more time. Oh, Andromedy, this must be very trying for you. <laughs> 
It's amazing uh, to think all of these books, all of these scrolls, the tapestries. Look at that tapestry he points up to a, a giant tapestry of, of some great epic on display. To think all of the, these things are just going to be burned, destroyed, only to be remade again. Ah, what a wonderful thought. I wish I had come here sooner. Let me see. What pertinent questions might I research quickly? Uh... Andromi, the first thing I would like you to do is make just a general perception check as you try and focus your mind and see what the best way to go about quickly finding anything here would be. All right, I'm going to give myself guidance for this. This seems significant. Gosh darn it. Uh, that's going to be a 15 total. On a 15, there are many more scrolls than there are books in this library, but you get the sense that there is a very discernible organizational pattern to this place. And so basically, you will have a limited number of these because this will take time and you have no idea when this entire temple could go up in lava. Mm -hmm. And so you can look for a very specific subject and try and make a role based on that. And then each one of those, depending on how good the role is, will kind of tell you how quickly you find these, whether or not you read them immediately or pocket them to, to read another time. Um, so I think the first thing I want to look for are any writings or specifically, I think, looking for prophecies about perhaps a siege uh, of Akros or Clothis's return from the underworld, anything that might pertain to, like, this specific moment in time. So these are investigation checks. Okay. And I will say that Volkos will help you. Okay. So these are going to be flat rolls. Great. Uh, and I'll give myself guidance for this as well. <sighs> Come on, dice. Uh, that's going to be a 14. Okay. You get the sense as you begin to look about this space that finding information specifically about Clothis is going to be very trying at best. Just considering that even your studies in the in the Citadel, you know, have led you kind of far afield in this subject, that even in such a magnificent library of a god, that those secrets may still yet be hard to find written down. But even on that roll, you find some very interesting titles. So this is the Tome of Understanding as we know it, and the author is an unnamed follower of Horizons. Andromedy would assume a disciple of Crufix. You pick this up, and as soon as you touch it, you immediately know what it could do. Basically, as you read it over the course of several days, it can increase your wisdom and your intelligence each by one point. Extremely powerful. Extremely powerful. But I guess this is a god's library, so it makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, you find no other specific titles on that very difficult and specific subject. While they're doing that, I want to just look at the closest book to me and see if it makes any sense at all. Gran, you walk up to the nearest stack of books. Go ahead and roll a d12 for me. Nine. The cover of this tome is brilliantly scribed, The Legend of Tecton. Tecton. Gron's learning. <laughs> you say that out loud and Volko <laughs> says, Oh, a worthy historical tome. Tecton is thought to be the first mortal that Perforos granted the secrets of bronze and, and metallurgy to. Quite a good read, I imagine. Mm. Clix is walking around, pulling out uh, not fully, but just kind of tilt pulling, like mildly pulling out books, you know, familiar enough with the idea of trap doors or secret passages. So just like, and not in a rush, just slowly doing it because he gets the sense they're going to be here a while. Clicks, let's go ahead and have an investigation check as you skulk about the room. 23. That's a great check. You peer through various tomes and scrolls, looking for any secret wall or chamber. You get around the perimeter of this space and 
don't find anything trip or trigger, but you move towards the center, kind of near where the small fire is lit, and surrounding it there is a large table of open stacks of scrolls and books, and one scroll is kind of placed very peculiarly in the table. Now, at 23, you go to pull at it, and you actually do trigger a secret chamber. There was one of these in the entire room, and it needed to be a DC 21 or higher. Holy shit. <laughs> you all watch as the fire and the vessel that it is burning on rises up revealing a large column underneath it. And in this column clicks, you see a space cut into it. Very ornate designs, the interior as well as the exterior. And inside it, you see a beautiful armlet, mm. like a large bracer that goes, that, that is worn on the forearm. Very nice. I'm gonna take it. Whoa, clicks, that is a beautiful relic to behold i would be careful but volkos doesn't stop you yeah i grab it as he himself can't help but admire the beauty of this relic you take it make me a dexterity saving throw oh, here we fucking go there's a 17 okay just because it's spicy, I'll tell you that was a DC 15, and so you pass. As you you go to reach into this space and grab it, the fire, same fire that, that was lit in this room, now sitting on top of this pedestal, kind of sparks and then bursts, and you have to back out of the way, but you are able to dodge the kind of explosive detonation from this. And so you are going to take half of the following fire damage. Sounds like a lot of fucking dicey. It was a lot. It. It, it was a lot, but it only amounted to total of five fire damage. And you have this beautiful armlet. As you touch it, you see that there are three beautiful phoenix feathers that are kind of molded into the metal itself of this piece. You do not know what it does yet. You you get the sense immediately that it is magical, though, and it is now yours. Sick. Clicks is happy. Andromedy, what other sorts of things would you try to look for? Just anything about, if not Clothis specifically, like musings on fate or destiny and things of that nature. Okay. Uh, go ahead and give me another investigation check. Uh, nice. That's going to be 23. Okay, that's a real good roll. You look about and you begin to kind of better understand the function of this library. While a lot of it are texts about various historical events, various philosophies, theology, it's all more directly or indirectly related to Perforos, much more than any other god. That is not to say that there aren't other gods mentioned in these various things, um, but they're all, one way or another, related to Perforos. And so that's a very good role, and so I'm going to give you a couple of titles that, as you would read them, would, as it relates to Perforos, have to do with that subject. And so the first one you pick up is called The Elements, Principles of Water, Fire, the Earth, and Their Gods. And I'll send all of you these uh, as well. Another one called The Stone Winter. And lastly, one called On the Origins of Civilization, The Fall of the Archons. Very good. And I think there's only one more thing I want to look for in here. Okay. Volkos, kind of seeing what you're going for, also makes something of a suggestion. Perhaps because it is of Perforos. Something a bit more, a bit more literal, a bit more about the nature of war or, or weaponry, or perhaps... Perforos is the god of creation and destruction, is he not? Indeed, that's true. So perhaps creation of relic or item, something? No, no. When Clothis spoke to me, she told me to seek creation's eye. Ah. If anyone were to have information about where it might be found, would it not be the god of creation himself? The wise deduction. Uh, so that's going to be the last thing I look for, any information about Creation's Eye. Okay, go ahead and make the final roll. Uh, that's kind of average. Uh, just a 15. A 15? The only thing you find that you think may be related in some way 
is a title called The Construction of Constructs, as well as a title called On Dragons and Other Natural Creations. Whether or not you know how useful these will be, you won't really know until you actually read them. All right. That is something I will probably do later because Temple's going to be flooded. So I believe this is as much research material as I feel I can safely recover. Thank you all for your patience. I think it is time for us to be moving on. Are we good here? Yes. I think I think we should be moving. I think perhaps the smoke has cleared above. So what's that left? Just the red door? Just the red door. Just the red door. Before we leave the library, Andromedy would do so with a bit of melancholy. They would sort of pause, looking back at it, sigh heavily, and sort of to themselves say, oh, I wish I had more time. I am not ready to go, but go I must. And then turn and leave. Go ahead and give me a religion check. Uh, Eleven. Goddammit disadvantage. Yeah. Exhaustion sucks. Yep. You proceed back up the stairs, and indeed, the smoke has cleared, and you see the door. The unlit braziers, however, on either side of this door are now burning with a deep red flame. You approach the door. It is very warm as you draw near. What do you all do? Hey, you should use that new fancy mall to bust this thing open. Okay. I look to Volkos, though. Is that a good idea? He kind of cocks his head and says, I'm not sure that your mall will bust these doors, but perhaps a very brilliant display of... On the mention of brilliant display, Click's kind of eyes widen and puts on the armlet to see if the armlet will push the door open. Hmm. Okay. Cool. Clicks, you don this armlet and you immediately feel the magic within it. You have attuned to this item, and this is the Phoenix Feather Armlet. It's a magic item, extremely rare, extremely valuable. Worn on the forearm, this armlet has three charges, represented by the three ornate Phoenix Feathers. As a reaction, you may spend any number of charges to reduce fire damage you've taken by the number of charges used times your character level. Additionally, you may instead choose to cast Hellish Rebuke. Casting this consumes all charges, and you cast it at the level equal to charges consumed. The charges restore daily. Sick. Well, I'm a badass, so pretty cool. Nice. Does it open the door, though? It does not. Well, that sucks. The fires are already lit? They are already lit. Mm. Gron, do you swing your maul at the door? Uh, That's worth a shot. Make a attack roll. It's a 16. That hits. As you swing your new shiny bronze maul into these doors, they burst open, revealing the chamber inside. You see before you a space that confuses bounds the mind. The inner chamber walls slant inward, as if you are stepping into the interior of the cone of a volcano. However, as you look up in this space, you see a red, swirling sky, the scope of which suggests that you are in a much larger space. You see several fountains of lava pouring out from far-off walls into an enormous pool that takes up the majority of this vast space. The floor before you extends out over this lake towards the center of the room where atop a series of ornate steps a brilliant anvil stands with a hammer resting atop it most importantly in this room a gargantuan statue of perforos himself stands facing the anvil rising up from the lava beyond it lastly as you enter this space the doors begin to close behind you The clouds begin swirling violently, and descending from above, you see two large, winged figures. Volkos, looking at all of this, turns to Gron and says, I told you you'd know them when you see them. Gron gulps audibly. As two dragons descend from the clouds. And let's have everybody go ahead and roll initiative. Uh, 19. 
It was gonna be a 20, but it rolled back over. Oh, I just shot so it. It's uh, gonna be a 4. Close. Oh, no. Almost the same thing. I also got a 4. I'm too tired to fight dragons. Okay. They approach the party. You can see as they fly towards you, one is a brilliant red dragon with bronze accents. The other, a bronze dragon with red accents. These two twin dragons both sharing a very clear Nyxborn property in that in the shadows of their form, not lit by the direct light of lava or anything else in the room, have glimmers of starlight about their form. Well overhead, we start with clicks. Uh, they're still about 30 feet above the party, kind of in the middle of the room. And in terms of, like, what's in the room, uh, like pillars, anything to hide behind like that? Go ahead and give me a perception check is a 12. You see that there are uh, pillars that are on the edges of this large platform. You could try and hide behind them depending on where they are in the space, uh, but they're also right next to literal lava, so that's, you know, a, a risk you would certainly obviously weigh on that roll. All four of you are still relatively near the door. What would you like to do? Where would you like to go? I think I'm honestly gonna... Two dragons flying at your clicks. What are you doing? I'm gonna hold my action. Okay. That is Volkos next, considering the other two rolled pretty poorly. You don't have to rub it in. Hey, I'm just <laughs> reading the numbers. Volkos is going to spend a key point and use Step of the Wind to get the fuck away from the rest of you, saying, Their fire can be quite nasty. Better not stick together if we don't have to. And uh, runs towards the large anvil in the center of the room uh, with great speed. Next, the red dragon flies down and lands directly in front of the three of you as Volkos has run away. What a motherfucker. <laughs> Sorry. That was rude. You could have run away too. You could have. You can actually still run away right now. That's true. You were, you were holding your action. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna run away. <laughs> I gave you every opportunity and you <laughs> sat there like a dumbass. So, so, no, <laughs> hear, wait, hear me out. I, I don't want to take too long on this, but like, I was thinking of this tactically. Like, my friends are gonna go out there. Well, I don't want to call on my friends. Clicks doesn't really feel that way yet, but you know, the compatriots were going to go out there and, like, I would come in after the enemy is engaged to hit up some sneak attacks. Mm -hmm. However, didn't really think that they're dragons and they're probably just going to come right at us. So, yeah, I'm going to run away. Uh, I'm just going to bolt uh, in the direction that Volko's headed. Okay. Okay. Glad we got that done. Red Dragon swoops down and lands in front of Andromedy and Grog. And it's going to make a bite attack at Grog. That is a 19 total. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you take 14 piercing damage and an additional 4 fire damage. As this large maw, this red dragon, bites into you. That is its turn. It is Gron and Andromedy. All right. Anything you want to do before I hit this thing? No, you go ahead. <laughs> All I'll, right. I'll follow on. <laughs> okay. Gron is feeling incredibly scared. He doesn't feel that scared very often, but he has never seen a dragon in real life before, and it's starting to fill him with just this fear. And it's going to manifest as rage. And in this room that's already like really incredibly hot, the air around Gron gets even hotter. If these dragons are not immune to fire damage... They are immune to fire damage. No. Then they don't take <laughs> two points of Sorry, fire damage. But I know someone that might... <laughs> Oh, shit. <laughs> no, it's, fine. it's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> All right. You you manifest this, this fiery rage aura, and the dragon in front of you just roars at you. <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, in my fear, I'm going to attack it recklessly with my maul. Yeah, that's going to be a 22 to hit. That'll hit. And that's going to be 12 bludgeoning damage right in this dragon's mouth, if I can hit it. Nice. Yeah, you fucking bludgeon this thing right on the face. Hit him right in the tooth. Yep. That's right. Anything else from Gron? Sorry. Andromedy. Uh, it's all right. What's a little more discomfort? Andromedy, that's you. You hit it pretty good there. Why don't you do that again? I'm going to cast Cure Wounds on you. 
You've got to be joking. You get four hit points back. Oh, no. The least I can restore to you. Uh, but also with my voice of authority, uh, you can use your reaction to take another attack. Nice. Okay. I'm going to attack him again. All right. Well, that's an 18 to hit. That will hit. Nice. All right. And that's going to be another 12 bludgeoning damage. Ron, you see this dragon in front of you. It is the size of an elephant. And you <laughs> manage to Not a dragon. find... <laughs> Well, it's the size of a dragon, but... Dragons come in different sizes. But Fair. it is on the smaller side of large, categorically. And so, despite its intimidating size, you are able to find purchase and deal some heavy damage to it in this first round. At the bottom of initiative, we have the bronze dragon. Flies down, stays flying in midair, and is going to dive towards clicks and Volkos. So this is going to be a bite attack on clicks. <coughs> Only a two on the dice. I think an eight misses. That is the bronze dragon. Uh, we go back to the top. On the top of the second round, we have a little lair action. These dragons now downed towards the platform. Everybody feels this rising heat in this room as you are literally in just in a big room full of lava, these big fire dragons. I'm going to need everybody to make me a constitution saving throw, please. 25. Nat 20 with a 24 total. Hell yeah. 13. Okay, so this is going to be half for everyone, and Drombi just passing that. That is three fire damage from the extreme heat in this volcanic chamber. That's back to clicks. Clicks looks beyond the bronze dragon directly at Volkos and says, time to see how this works. And pulls out the, uh, what the fuck is it called? The Phoenix Feather Armlet. Uh, what level is the Hellish Rebuke on that? Hellish Rebuke is a reaction. Yeah, you take it in reaction to taking damage. Layer actions don't count? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ah, hey, that's so a that's good. up for interpretation. Yeah, we don't need to go um, digging around rules. You can just tell me what I you would think. say for this specific thing. It's probably not something created by the dragons. Yeah, so I yeah. would rule no. But yeah, I'm gonna say the same. All right, clicks takes out his hand. Nothing happens. Shit. And uh, then he unsheathes his sword and tries to swipe at the dragon who is a little above him but still in melee range. Great. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I'm just gonna go for uh, for an attack. Then go for it. Okay, does a 20 hit? 20 hits. All right, there is six, and then my sneak attack. Uh, 10 damage total. You swing into this. Anything bonus action, offhand attack, anything like that? Absolutely. Yeah. That misses. Clicks goes to take the dagger and kind of slash at the ankles of this, you know, levitate, you know, like mildly floating above the platform dragon here and just kind of dinks his little dragon nail. Shit. The hide of this dragon too tough for Clicks' dagger. No, no, no. It was his toenail specifically. Oh. He dinked it <laughs> off the toenail. Nice. Making sure we're, yeah, we got to keep that cannon. That is Volkos now is going to look at you and say, Look who decided to be brave! And is going to attack, also with advantage. <laughs> that is going to hit. He's going to spend a key point to flurry of blows. One of them a crit, the other one a miss. Volkos on the bronze dragon, dealing 16 total, not bad. And then after Volkos, the red dragon lets out another roar after Gron swung into it twice. And it's going to bite again with advantage, because Gron attacked it recklessly. And that's a nat 1 on the first roll, and a 12 plus 6 on the second. Uh, I think you're mistaken. It's a 6 plus 6. Ah, okay. Andromedy, what does that little move look like? So, again, sometimes idly, Andromedy will move their hands, sort of plucking and unnodding at these invisible strings. But at this precise moment, as the dragon, like, uh, reaches out its jaws, their hand sort of tenses into a, like a, like a pulling motion, 
and they sort of yank their arm and divert the course of the dragon's bite to the empty air next to where Gron is standing. Awesome. Very cool. That is its turn. It is now Gron. Ugh. I really thought that was going to hit me. <laughs> it was not meant to be. Yeah, I suppose I'll just hit it. Don't have much else I can do. Here we go. I'm going to hit it recklessly. I didn't learn any lesson from the last round. That's 21 to hit. That hits. And that's going to be 13 bludgeoning damage. Nice. Swing into this thing, and it's starting to look a little hurt. Uh, you can see some of this Nyx-born blood being smashed against the rock surface of this platform as you swing. That is a drop turn. Could I move around to the back of it to get into a flanking position? Sure. Okay, cool. So I'm going to do that, and I'm going to attempt to touch it with a spell attack. Okay. I will say, as you move around it, you have definitely drawn its ire with your little divination trick. It mm. seems to have caught that bit of Nixian influence, and you have definitely drawn its gaze. All right. Well, I'm going to draw a bit more of its ire now. <laughs> Okay, that attack with advantage is a natural 20. Holy shit, nice. So, let me get out some more d10s as I'm going to roll eight of them. Oh no! As I that second is... level inflict wounds on this dragon. Oh, nice! This might do damage. It's no clicks attack, but it'll do something. Here comes a big pile of dice. Here comes a big pile of dice. They're not just for you, Andy. Good sound. Okay, 10, 20, 30, 39, 45 points of necrotic damage. Holy shit. <laughs> Extremely hurt. Sent from moderately injured to borderline death's door. Describe what that attack looks like. Again, the sort of threads that Andromeda is toying with in their hands begin to take on a very physical aspect, and at the end of them, these glowing green needles appear and drive themselves into the dragon's flesh, perhaps between their scales, at critical points in their neck and chest, and they just really dig in there as Andromeda reaches out their hand to touch this dragon. Amazing. Well, you... Yeah, like yeah, you said, you I, definitely fucking... <laughs> pissed it off now. You can see as injured as it is, it staggers towards you, fire beginning to coalesce around its mouth. We go to the bronze dragon who is fighting with Clix and Volkos. Still in the air, it's going to fly up a bit and it moves closer to the anvil at the center of the room that is at the end of this platform. Makes a bite attack at Volkos. Critting on Volkos. Oh no, Volkos, no! That's my NPC! <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Yikes! Volkos taking 18 plus 8 damage. Luckily, he is resistant to the fire damage. Still taking quite a lot as this dragon bites into him. That is back to the top. You hear from the lava in this room laughter and voices, a number of them, kind of coming out saying, We wish to test his fire, or they will be destroyed. We will burn their bodies. These fey creatures you can see coming up out of the lava one by one. These oreads, these fire nymphs, dryad-like figures, but made of volcanic rock and this very porcelain red skin. And they are going to have everybody make a dexterity saving throw as the platform begins to tremble and and quake from their commotion. Uh -oh. oh, I used up all my luck. That's a five. Andromeda, you are knocked prone. Yep. Eleven. Ron, you are knocked prone. Thirteen. And Clix, you managed to stay your footing. Clix arrogantly is like, huh, that's right. Volkos looking injured. Let me roll for him. Volkos is also knocked prone. <laughs> oh, this is really taking a turn. Clix, good for you. He says as he, <laughs> as he falls over. That is clicks. Can I get to the wounded dragon? Attack it? Yeah. Let's do it. Uh, this is a 16 hit. 16 just misses. Motherless. Okay. Offhand. Yeah, let's, let's 
does an 18. 18 hits. Uh, 12 damage total. Okay. Oh my god, it's so close. <laughs> Holy shit. It is gravely injured uh, as you swing into it, missing once and finding... I always use the term finding purchase, so um, your second blade... Descriptions are hard not to be repetitive, aren't they? Um, your second blade finding its mark. We go to Volkos, who is going to get up. He's going to attack the bronze dragon once, missing, unfortunately. Seeing that the rest of the party is dealing with the red dragon, he's going to use his bonus action to patient defense, try and raise his AC a little bit, as Clix has left him uh, by himself. Oh, I, I see how it is. That is now the red dragon. Clicks, you go to the aid of your allies, just in time for this red dragon to open its maw and unleash a fiery breath towards Andromedy and you. I need both of you to make dexterity saving throws. 19. That one. Uh-oh. <laughs> That doesn't pass, right, in that one? I told you, I used all my luck for the session. Andromedy, taking the brunt of this fire breath, take 24 fire damage. Oh, that's great. That's how many hit points I had. Clicks, you take half of that. Clicks, you watch as Andromedy falls beside you. I'm going to use my reaction to attack it. All right, invoking Sentinel. Are you still prone, Gron? I am. So this is going to be a straight roll, then. So, lying here on the ground, I've just been knocked over, and I see my friends are in trouble, and Dramedy is knocked over and fairly charred. I reach for my maul, which is lying near me on the ground, and I lash out with it, and a 25 is going to hit. 25 is going yes. to hit. <laughs> this is going to be 16 bludgeoning damage. Holy shit. Lying down. Like... <laughs> I picture you like you're laying down, you're like fucking t sleepily waving your maul around, hoping you hit something. So, Gron, given your predicament, paint a picture. I managed to grab my maul and from this lying down position, swing it wildly in the direction of the dragon, and the maul finds purchase in the dragon's jaw. Amazing. And kind of smashes it away from my friends. Take that, dragon! <laughs> Dragons aren't that scary. It turns out. <laughs> I, I would disagree with you, but I, I'm kind of unconscious right now. <laughs> Amazing. Volkos from the distance, while well, he has this kind of monk defensive guard up, just kind of turns his head back to see you finish this dragon and goes, That's it, Gron! Oh, Andromedy! No! That was the dragon. It's dead now. We go to Gron. Well, Gron stands up. Start there. <laughs> How far is this the other dragon from where I am the, now? The bronze dragon is now pretty far away, way up by the anvil, so it's it's a full, like, 60 feet or more to get to get to the bronze dragon. Oh, well, I used half my movement to stand up, you did but use half I can cover 60 feet and attack in the same turn as a minotaur. Oh, shit. I'm gonna say that that's going to be an athletics roll. If you roll well, you will definitely be able to do it. It's a 13. Yeah, you can't quite cover the distance. You charge up and make it to, say, within 5 or 10 feet of Volkos, but you uh, can't quite get to the dragon yet. Okay, that's still a good place to be. I want to get as close to Volkos as possible. That is Gron's turn. Dramedy. Death save? That will be the first death save of the game, please. 10. Okay, Plus, that is... You, a, add, you don't you add constitution add nothing. to it. That's still a pass. We go back to the bronze dragon now. How spicy do I want to make this? Gron, you charge directly towards Volkos and this bronze dragon, just in time to take its breath attack. The dragon opens its maw. Instead of a large frontal cone, the bronze dragon fires almost like a large ray, a large gout of lava from its mouth directly in a line, hitting both you and Volkos and Klix. Klix, you catch the end of this fire breath ray. I need Gron and Klix and Volkos to make a deck save. Volkos passes. 21. 
Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> it doesn't sound like Jimmy got something like that either, though. Yeah, every one of these deck saves are with advantage, and I keep rolling single digits on both dice. That sucks. <laughs> That's a six total. Okay. So, Clix and Volkos taking half. Volkos only taking a quarter because of his resistance. Volkos also generally not looking great either health-wise. Gron taking the brunt of this as you charge into the fray. You take 20 fire damage. Bring it on, dragon! Clix takes 10. Ooh. takes 5. Clix is not feeling great. <laughs> uh, I want a, a ruling on this. Um, okay. So I have this feature called Companion's Protection that comes mm -hmm. from the Supernatural Gift. Yep. When a creature you can see within 5 feet of you is hit by an attack roll, you can use your reaction to cause the attack to hit you instead. No, no right? Roll. Yeah, I didn't no, think so. Nothing I, is that's... rolled, unfortunately. Right. Okay. Yeah, in S Sentinel is not phrased that way. It doesn't have the word roll in it. Correct. Just an attack. Yeah. Sentinel's pretty broken. Um, <laughs> so the bronze dragon <laughs> roars out, and we go back to the top. That's another lair action. That is the Oreads again. You now see them kind of jumping up out of the lava and dancing around the sides of the platform. It begins quaking and trembling again at their disruptive and destructive presence. Andromeda, you're already on the ground, so yeah, I just I can't need, get more prone. I just need uh, Clix and Gron to go ahead and make another deck save, please. 16. 17. Okay, yeah, you both stay up. Volkos does as well. And that is clicks. I will cast Attack Dragon with Sword. Hell yeah. Cool. This is a little precarious, because now it's basically blocking the narrow stairs that lead up to the anvil in the middle of this room. So if you wanted to try to jump behind it, I would need a roll one way or the other. It's time to roll. Let's roll. What role does it require? Hey, okay, clicks. You go to try and acrobatics your way around this yes. bronze dragon as All they right. are between Volkos and these narrow stairs okay. up to the central platform. Go ahead and roll. Uh, 22 ought to do it. Holy shit. <laughs> That will do it. It was going to be a tough DC because, you know, of the lava and everything else. And a dragon. And, and the dragon. <laughs> but, uh, you know, fuck my DC 20s. So uh, that's going to pass. You get behind the dragon. Time to end this. He says, purring. No, that, that's, he's not purring. He's really upset. <laughs> he he's not <laughs> purring at all. All right. He's purring out of fear. Cats do that. Cats do that. It's a coping mechanism. He's so scared right now. Clicks. All right. Uh, let's beat the shit out of this dragon. <laughs> With advantage, uh, I'm going to go ahead and guess that an 18 hits. Yep. So it's 10 damage, and I'm going to do my offhand. Does a 16 hit? 16 will just miss. Okay, so 10 damage. Cool. Narrowly escaping, falling off the side of this platform into a lake of lava. Clicks deftly makes it to the other side of this dragon, attacking it. But the dragon evading your second attack. That is Volkos. Is this dragon looking hurt at all? It's looking hurt. It's looking hurt. It didn't take nearly as much damage considering Gron hasn't been wailing into it at all. <laughs> okay. I, I've got to say, just looking at the numbers, Gron is a big stick. Man, oh man. <laughs> Just can wail on stuff. Oh my god. Very cool. Um, well, actually, I say that, and here Andromedy did the biggest single attack, uh, which. That's true. Really. Yeah, that was nasty. That cool. counted for a lot. Yeah, that was lucky. But Andromedy is, is lying on the ground, and yep. seeing that, Volkos turns around. Okay, good clicks, yes. And Gron, good. I love how Volkos assessed clicks and decided clicks is in good shape. I have two HP. What? <laughs> I am beat to shit. And he's like, oh, you're good. You're the closest to the dragon and on death's door, but I'll ignore you. That's <laughs> fine. Volkos uses Step of the Wind to disengage so he doesn't take an attack as he steps away and towards Andromedy. Can't get all the way towards them, but will cast Cure Wounds on himself on this turn. <clears throat> healing a bit. Gron, he passes you and with a deferential nod says, I think you know what to do at this point. Red Dragon's dead, just in time for Gron. It's always time for Gron. It's Gron time, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so horrible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Just gonna 
smack it again with them all. <laughs> 24 is going to hit it. That's going to hit it. Jesus Christ. And uh, that one is going to become a two. Yep. 15 bludgeoning damage in this dragon's teeth. This dragon turns around towards you and roars <sighs> just before getting smacked in the mouth by the shiny new maul that Gron has. Click sees uh, Gron smash this thing in the, in the mouth and is like so impressed with Gron's combat ability. He starts to get a little excited. The fear kind of goes away, and he's like, looks like you need a dentist. He shouts out to the dragon, all giddy that his buddy now is, like, kicking total ass. Cool that they have dentists in ancient Greece. <laughs> all the Oreads that are around in this room now just, like, laugh at Clix's bad joke. <laughs> Clix feels on top of the world. It's unsettling. I'm going to use my bonus action to try to shove it. Oh, yeah. You can you can try. All right. So uh, as I smack this dragon's teeth away from where I am with my <laughs> maul, its head gets pushed out of the way, and I just come at it with my horns and kind of lock them into its neck and try to push it off the side. That's a strength saving throw. A DC is 15. <clears throat> It rolls a 15 on the dice, making oh. it a 19 total. It doesn't move, and I guess it was worth a try. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of plants its feet into the ground, and unmoving, you are now right up against this bronze dragon. Uh huh. We go to Andromedae. Another death save, save please. Nope, that's a fail. What was it? A uh, four. Okay, Andromedy now at one and one for death saves. Bronze Dragon's going to make an attack on Gron. <coughs> Rolling a 19 on the dice. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Gron, that is only six piercing damage and four fire damage. All right. The piercing damage is halved because of the rage. Yep. Gron is very hurt, but he's still up. Is Gron in single digits yet? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Wow. This is not good. <laughs> Getting the barbarian down to single digits. This is immensely bad. <laughs> you know it's a spicy combat. If we go back to the top... How about no more layer actions? There's still dragons alive. How about no more layer actions? This one is spicier. I don't like that. So I need everybody to make a deck save as large rocks and boulders begin to tumble down onto the platform. 16. 30, 20. Okay. Gron and Clix both pass. You're able to completely avoid these falling boulders. However, Andromedy unconscious ends up taking eight bludgeoning damage, which is an automatic fail. Yep. Uh-oh. Andromedy now on one and two. Volkos seeing this, oh dear, oh dear, is going to try his best to get to Andromedy before anything else happens. That is Clix's turn. Attack dragon. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it's my favorite move. That's a no. Um, so let's try offhand. Even with advantage. Even with advantage. Just absolute. Okay, there it is. 23 ought to do it. Yep. So that is one damage, but I do have sneak attack going on here. Yep. So 12 total. Okay, really good sneak attack. Clicks, you can start to see the metallic scales of this dragon starting to show a lot of wear. It is starting to look pretty injured. We go now to Volkos, makes it to Andromedy, kneels down beside them. Always have a backup spell slot handy for something like this. And casts his final cure wounds. I like your little defibrillator motion there. <laughs> yeah, he takes his warm worn flame speaker hands places them on you and that's going to be 14 rolling max on two dice there andromedy is back up and you know as a bonus action because he's just going to be super cautious he turns around kind of to block this dragon's view of andromedy while they are still on the ground and takes another patient defense with his bonus action are you with us? Yes, thank you, Sophistes. Quite the trial, hey? That is Gron. Okay, I'm gonna hit the dragon. <laughs> hit it with my maul. It's a 22 to hit. That hits. 13 bludgeoning damage. This one is more of an upwards motion. I hit it in the chin. Nice. Yeah, all of this, like, smacking the dragons in the face really gives me some Skyrim vibes. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> smacking it around. <laughs> Looking quite hurt, Gron, you can kind of tell this bronze dragon doesn't have the the beef that the red dragon had, and so it's looking quite hurt. This is Andromeda's turn. Okay, Andromeda is going to use half their movement to stand up. Seeing you stand, uh, some of the nearby Oreads kind of laugh and say, oh, This one's got to back up. Don't usually do that. <laughs> I'll say back to them in Sylvan. We are no ordinary people. We were chosen. Clicks seeing seeing Andromeda get back up, shouts out, Preacher, we need your help. Yeah, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try. <laughs> Honestly, I feel like the best way I can help is to give Gron more attacks. So I will have Scully deliver this Cure Wounds. Nice. That's cool. Yeah, you see the giant moth fly up. And you regain eight hit points and can use your reaction to take an attack. Great. I'm gonna do it. 17. That just hits. 17 is their AC. Wow. Sick. Yeah, you guys have been dancing around that number a lot. That's 14 bludgeoning damage. Ron, paint another picture. Thank God. <laughs> Fucking getting <laughs> kills on both fuck. of them. So as these red threads close up Gron's wounds, he straightens up his posture and holds his maul up, and with a brutal spinning swing, knocks this dragon off the side of this bridge. He absolutely does. You swing a full 360 with your maul and crash into this dragon, and the Nixian life force fades as it crashes down into the lava next to this platform. We exit initiative as the entire chamber begins rumbling, the Oreads looking around frantically. Oh no, you've done it now. And all scatter back into the lava. Volkos looking at all of you. Prepare yourselves. We are about to come face to face with the god. Pods of the Multiverse is produced by Jimmy Afadigato. That's me, with music by Andy Berger and art by Alexa Riley. Subscribe to this feed to get a new episode every Monday. Check out the links in the show notes. You can support us by visiting our Patreon, joining our Discord, or sharing this episode with a friend. We want to give a special shout out to our Holy Avengers, Jake and May. For $10 a month on our Patreon, you too can become a Holy Avenger. Thanks for listening.